Hello, I greet you, and I greet you in the presence of the Most Holy Trinity, of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We all know, and we are all convinced that God loves us, and He loves us without limit, and that He wants us to love Him in response to His merciful love for us. God loves everyone, no one is excluded, and this helps us so that we love everyone as well, and we don't exclude anyone from our love. So, God loves everyone, and no one is excluded, and He wants everyone to love Him. But even if we all loved God, the degree of love we would have will not be equal in each one of us. And this is the point I would like to raise today. There will be those who love God less and those who love God more. There will always be an inequality in the degree of our love for God. I have already mentioned in one of my previous talks that we can love God either with imperfect love or we can love Him with perfect love. We love Him with imperfect love when our intention of doing His will for us is to go to heaven and not to go to hell. We love Him with perfect love when our intention of doing His will for us is because He is our Father, our dearest Father, our Heavenly Father, because He is our greatest friend, because He loves us without limit, precisely, because He loves us without limit. And so we want to love Him as much as we can. That is perfect love. Precisely, we want to love Him as much as we can. Now, notwithstanding our love for God, our love is not of the same degree, even among those who love God with imperfect love. No one loves God as much as anyone else. They love Him either less or more. Even among those who love God with perfect love, no one loves Him as much as anyone else. They love Him either more or less. Of course, those who love God with perfect love love Him more than those who love Him with imperfect love. The difference in the degree of love also exists among angels. Among angels, there is no one who loves God with imperfect love. They all love Him with perfect love. The souls in purgatory love God with imperfect love. As soon as their love grows and becomes perfect, they immediately ascend to heaven. But even in purgatory, not every soul loves God in the same degree of imperfect love as any other soul. There are those who love God more and those who love Him less. Also in heaven regarding saints, I have already spoken about angels in heaven. I can say the same, th same thing about saints. All saints love God with perfect love, but they don't love Him equally. Now, in heaven, all angels are loving God, as I said, with perfect love. But no angel has a degree of love for God equal to that of any other angel. In heaven, all saints are loving God with perfect love. But no saint has a degree of love for God equal to that of any other saint. 
In heaven, there are millions and millions of angels. There are millions and millions of saints, all loving God with perfect love. But not equally, there are those who love him more and those who love him less. Where does this difference in the degree of love come from? It comes from God and from us. God gives his grace to everyone because he wants everyone to be saved. God wants to give his grace to everyone so that everyone becomes a saint. But he does not give the same degree of grace to everyone. He gave, for instance, to the Blessed Virgin Mary the highest degree of grace. As a matter of fact, the Archangel Gabriel greeted her, Hail, full of grace. He didn't tell her, Hail, Mary, full of grace. So to say, Mary is, is her name for us. We consider her as Mary. But for God, her name is full of grace. Full of grace. So, then also the saints in heaven, when they were in the world, they were, there were those who received more graces from God and those who received fewer graces. There were those who received graces of a high degree and those who received the graces of a lower degree. And of course, I have to point out as well regarding the Virgin Mary, she is the greatest saint in heaven, the greatest saint among all human beings. She is full of grace and full of perfect love. No saint is or will be in heaven who will have a greater amount of grace in him or in her more than the Virgin Mary and the same. No saint will ever be in heaven who will have a greater amount of love for God more than the Virgin Mary. She is the sun, so to say, the sun shining in heaven that God has created as, so to say, the greatest saint and the greatest lover of God. Out of his mercy, God is pleased to give us his graces. He gives them to us for free, his graces. God gives us graces freely, gratis, free of charge. We don't pay for them. Eh? Perhaps we pray for them. All right, okay, we can pray for graces. And we have no right to them. We have to be careful about that. We have no right to God's graces. God gives us his graces out of his infinite mercy for us, out of his infinite love for us. The number of graces and the degree of each grace is not the same for each one of us. Some receive more, some receive fewer graces. Some receive a grace or graces of a high degree, others receive graces of a lower degree. He is God, infinite in his mercy, and everything his da he does is good. He knows which grace or graces we need, and he gives us those graces that we need so that we grow closer to him. We should always thank him for all the graces he bestows upon us. Now, besides the number and degree of graces he gives us, there is also the question of our cooperation with these graces. And this cooperation of ours is different among us there are those who cooperate more and those who cooperate less. 
Therefore, our cooperation with God's graces is also a reason for us to have, each one of us, a different degree of love of God in us and a different degree of grace in us, both in this world and in heaven as well. So, if we want to grow more in the degree of grace in us, if we want to grow more in the degree of love for God in us, we must always cooperate with all the graces that God showers upon us. Whoever has any difficulty with what I am saying can ask me. I always answer your questions as clearly as possible and according to your needs. You can also share your opinion on what I am saying. We can learn much from each other and grow in our perfect love of God together. You can also post the prayer you like best, even if invented by yourself. Everyone knows how to post the message on this video or on any other video of mine. Now, I shall pass on to St. John Bosco. I have called today's video St. John Bosco and Kenin Bremon. Kenin, as you know, is a priest with some uh, honor, particular honor in a particular church, Kenin. Bremon, it's a French surname, Bremon. B-R-E, accent aigu. M-O-N-D, Bremon. As you know, in French, we don't pronounce the last letter. So, St. John Bosco and Kenin, father also, Bremon. Kenin Bremon was the parish priest of Lubier in the Diocese of Toulon, France. So, Toulon, as you know, is a city in France on the Mediterranean Sea on the south so, of France, Toulon. Uh, and uh, one of the suburbs of Toulon is precisely Lubier. It's a parish, so as well, it's a parish. The parish of Lubier in the city of Toulon. And Canon Bremont was the parish priest of this suburb, Lubier. When he was young, so he's narrating when he was young, and Don Bosco was in Toulon. When he was young, Kenin Bremon was an altar boy and in church, and he was an altar boy in the church of Roquefort. Roquefort. Uh, Roquefort is a village near Toulon. Roquefort is written R-O-Q-U-E, F-O-R-T, Roquefort. It's a village near Toulon. And uh, so, as you know, before the Second Vatican Council, Mass was in Latin. And uh, a priest used to have an altar boy, or even two altar boys sometimes, to serve. We say to serve, to serve Mass, to help him. And uh, one of the duties of these altar boys was to answer in Latin, the prayers of the priest. I remember a time when the priest started Mass. He used to say, In Troibo ad altare Dei. I enter to the altar of God. And the altar boy used to answer, Ad Deum qui letificat juventutem meam. To God who rejoices my youth. Yes, so we have this canon Bremon. When he was still young, he was an altar boy, and he used to serve mass in the church of Roquefort. And therefore, had the opportunity to help St. John Bosco say mass as well in, his ch in the, ch the church where he was an altar boy. He said, so Ken Bremont is recalling, he said, that even though he was still young, 
he realized that there was something special in St. John Bosco. He was impressed with the way Don Bosco said Mass. This is something that happened with a number of saints, priestly saints who were, who were priests, of course, because lay people uh, do not say Mass, but uh, we, we hear Mass, but we don't celebrate Mass. Uh, the way they celebrated Mass, uh, these special saints, uh, it was something admirable that you, you couldn't be there present at their Mass without noticing that they have something special in them. And the special thing was holiness, holiness. Uh, but you understand that there would be some, the mass is the same, celebrated even by the wickedest priest. Mass, mass has the same effect for those who are hearing mass. But the way a priest celebrates mass makes a difference one from the other. Uh, sometimes it's something to be, uh, to, 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 be, to, to be noticed, I have to say that. You have the priest, and the missile, it makes a difference when a priest is reading the prayers and the priest who is praying the prayers written or printed on the missile. So it makes a difference. And this can was not a very, uh, so to say, very. Uh, I mean, he was a good boy, all right, he was a boy, he was a boy, uh, but he was naughty perhaps as well, you know, now I shall tell you why. Notwithstanding his naughtiness, he realized that there was something special about St. John Bosco while celebrating Mass. He was impressed with the way Don Bosco said Mass. He celebrated it in a way that he had never seen before. The celebrant's attitude on the altar charmed him to the extent that he didn't take his eyes off him. Canon Bremo said that, see how, why I said he was a, a little naughty. He said that as an altar boy during mass, he used to play with another altar boy who would be there with him to serve mass. While the priest faced the altar, you know, at, at that time, but the priest faced the altar, not the congregation, giving his back to the congregation. So Premon, as an altar boy, and his friend, an altar altar boy, used to play on the steps of the altar while the priest continued Mass. Notwithstanding that, when Don Bosco was there celebrating Mass, he was attracted by his presence, by the way he celebrated Mass by his holiness. Canon Bremont recalled as well, when St. John Bosco once left Roquefort and went to Toulon, where people were eagerly awaiting him to give them a conference, eh? a talk. As a matter of fact, St. John Bosco gave them a lecture, eh? gave them, um, or a talk if you want, eh? a sermon, in the parish church of St. Mary which was literally packed with people. So this is in Toulon now, in the city of Toulon. A report on the occasion appeared in a French Catholic newspaper. This newspaper still exists, of course, in the um, uh, yes, public libraries. And the newspaper's name was La Sentinelle du Midi. Of course, Toulon is in, uh, a French city. The newspaper was published in French. And uh, the name of this newspaper was La Sentinelle du Midi, the Sentinel of the South. You know that Toulon is in the south of France. Uh, you know, a sentinel. A sentinel is you know, a soldier, a guard, whose job is to stand guard, to stand guard. And in this newspaper, in the issue of the 5th of March, 1881, 
eh? the 5th of March 1881, 1881. In that issue, we read the following, a report about St. John Bosco's sermon. In this newspaper, so we read, after the Gospel, St. John Bosco went up on the pulpit and by his first words, he drew the attention of all the congregation gathered in church. Don Bosco was not a tall man and he spoke French with some difficulty. Not to just, um, I would say that St. John Bosco was very intelligent and he studied a lot. He knew Latin very well and he knew Greek very well. Well, I am referring to classical Greek and as well to biblical Greek, to biblical Greek. So, um, so uh, Don Bosco, but in the case of French, uh, he was Italian. He was Italian. He knew French, but he wasn't as fluent in French as he was in Italian. You understand that, is it? Italian was his mother tongue. So now, and so the, this, this newspaper said after the gospel, St. John Bosco went on the pulpit to speak to the people. That was something common at that time that uh, sermons were done on the pulpit. Uh, even the priest used to leave, leave the, the, the altar and go on the pulpit he makes, um, ma to make a sermon and then he went down again to continue mass. Uh, uh, so today, today uh, the priest normally, uh, as you know, after the Second uh, Vatican Council, priests remain on the altar perhaps on the lectern. They, they can choose anywhere because sometimes please even they have a mobile uh, you know microphone and they can go from one side to another. Sometimes even they go down in the aisle of the church and they speak the way they like today. But in, in that, at that time priests only went on the, in the pulpit to speak to the to people. Now so Don Bosco, the, the newspaper is telling us, was not at all men. And, uh, but notwithstanding this, that is, notwithstanding that he spoke French with some difficulty, his own appearance was a source of great sympathy. St. John Bosco is a taumaturge. When we say taumaturge, means a wonder worker. Or, or, or a miracle worker. It means one who performs miracles, miracles. They knew about that, then Don Bosco performed miracles and more. He is an apostle, or apostle of charity. He is a man according to God's heart. And more than that, he is a saint. Now, this is the report the newspaper La Sentinelle du Midi said about Don Bosco. And it continues, the report continues. St. John Bosco, according to the report in the newspaper, La Sentinelle du Midi, St. John Bosco began to apologize for not being able to speak French well, saying that he could not speak with the elegance of Massillon, nor with the eloquence of Bosuet. Now, St. John Bosco mentioned two persons, two bishops. Massillon, first of all, Massillon, it's written in French, M A L S, I L L O N. In French, I L L, I L L is uh, pronounced E, E. So that's why I'm saying Massillon, Massillon. Now, Massillon, that's his surname. And uh, his name was Jean Baptiste, John Baptiste. So Jean Baptiste Massillon. He was a French bishop and a great preacher. That's why St. John Bosco was saying, I am not speaking with the elegance of Massillon, eh? a great preacher and orator, orator. And he said, nor with the eloquence of Bosuet. Now, Bosuet as well. Is a surname, a surname. His name is Jacques Benin. Jacques, Jack, 
eh? or James, if you want, Jacques, Benin, Beninio, eh? Boswell his surname. Uh, it's written B O L S U E T, and we we pronounce it Bosier, eh? Bos Boswell, Boswell, Boswell. That is the exact pronunciation, Boswell. Uh, now the same Boswell was a French bishop, a great preacher, theologian, and a famous famous orator, orator. Eh? And Don Bosco is saying humbly that he is doing his best to pass on a message to the congregation as best as he could in a foreign language after all. During his sermon, oh, if, you, if you want, during his talk there, Don Bosco started speaking about the beginning of his work with children and young people in Turin, there in the Valdocco area. He then went on to mention the expansion of the Salesian work. So Don Bosco first started, first, I mean, he started, he began talking about how he started his work among children and young people in Turin. And then he passed on how his work expanded in Turin, in other Italian cities, and even outside of Italy. And he is saying now that he mentioned in particular regarding the expansion of the Salesian work, he mentioned in particular Salesian houses near Toulon, not in Toulon, near Toulon, namely those on of San Sir. San Sir is pronounced Saint in English, S-A-I-N-T, but in French it's, it's, uh, it's pronounced San, San and Sir, C-Y-R, Sir, San Sir. There the Salesians had a number of houses. And uh, another one in the houses of La Navarre. La Navarre. La Navarre is a large city, 22 kilometers away from Toulon. Now, when I am saying, I am not saying oratory, I am saying houses, Salesian houses. Why? Because normally, wherever the Salesians were present, they had the chapel or church, they had the oratory, they had schools. And there was a convent where they lived, so a number of, you know, buildings, so to say. Uh, and uh, Don Bosco was telling them that, well, near Toulon, there were two villages, eh? although Navarre, is a, we can call it even a city, uh, San Sir, and um, where these allegiance needed a lot of money for the maintenance of the buildings. They still, some buildings were still under construction and they needed a great help, especially financial help. And the newspaper went on to say that Don Bosco's words came out in a lively, energetic and picturesque voice. And the same linguistic mistakes, you know, because he couldn't speak French very well, but his linguistic mistakes, so to say, made a greater contribution to attract even more attention from everyone in the church. So even his mistakes were so welcomed by the congregation that they were uh, charmed more by his words, by, by his mistakes. At the end of the talk, he got down from the pulpit took a silver plate from somewhere there in that church and began to go around himself to collect money from the congregation, for the, always for the Salesian houses, namely of San Sir and of La Navarre. Now, while he was going around collecting money, an interesting incident occurred. A worker as soon as Don Bosco came to him, of course, uh, so that he could give something, some money, 
this, this worker turned his face and shrugged his shoulder, uh, thus telling him that he was not interested in giving anything. Wearing a smile on his lips, Don Bosco said to him, God bless you. Hearing these words, that man put his hand in his pocket and gave Don Bosco a penny. Don Bosco fixed his eyes upon him and told him, May God reward you. Then the worker put his hand back in his pocket, took out two pennies out of the pocket and dropped them in, into Don Bosco's silver plate. There and then Don Bosco said to him, My dear, God will provide you much more. As he heard this, the worker put his hand in his other pocket and took out his purse, giving Don Bosco a French franc. Don Bosco gave him a pitiful look, walked away from him and continued with his collection. But that worker, getting zealous for Don Bosco, stood up and followed Don Bosco throughout the whole church. Then he followed him into the sacristy. When it was time for Don Bosco to leave the church, that man continued to follow him until he saw him no more. He was very attracted by Don Bosco's presence. Also, now remember that this happened in Toulon. Now also in Toulon, Mary, help of Christians, interceded before her son Jesus so that Don Bosco would perform another miracle. An 18-year-old woman who lived a short distance from Toulon, she didn't live in Toulon, outside of Toulon, but not far away from Toulon, but she had a severe liver pain, a great pain in her liver. And in vain did she bring some medical doctors to cure her, and in vain did she take prescribed medicines so that she would feel no pain. This young lady was a Salesian cooperator. She greatly desired to go and hear St. John Bosco preaching, but she couldn't because of her great pain. In March 1881, so we are in the year 1881, in March 1881, she went to bed seriously ill, without hope of ever coming out of it again. She knew that there was St. John Bosco in Toulon, but no hope. She firmly believed that the presence of St. John Bosco would have been a great benefit to her, for she had heard that St. John Bosco was a saint and performed many miracles. So, she asked a friend of hers to go and speak to St. John Bosco about her physical health, about her great desire to see him and listen to his sermons. On hearing about her miserable state, Don Bosco agreed to go and see her and make her happy. When he got to her house, her mother immediately took him to the bedroom where the sick lady was lying. Don Bosco gave her a pitiful look and told her to have great confidence in mere help of Christians. He blessed her with the blessing of mere help of Christians and left. As he was leaving the room, he said to her mother, who was leaving that room as well with him, I am saying it in French, que Dieu lui accorde la santé. In, in English means, Don Bosco told, told her to her mother, may God, may God grant her, to, to your daughter it means, eh? to her, the mother's daughter, may God grant her 
holiness. When her mother heard these words, she thought that her daughter was going to die and began to cry. But then when Don Bosco understood why she was crying, he went on to say, Ella Sante, meaning and held. So Don Bosco wanted to, her, to tell her, may God grant her holiness and health. But immediately, as soon as he said, may God grant her holiness, she understood that she is going to die. And of course, <laughs> but, so as he said this, he went out while recommending them again, both to her mother and daughter, to have great confidence in mere help of Christians. As a matter of fact, their trust in mere help of Christians was not in vain. One week later, St. John Bosco gave another talk, this time in the church of St. Isidore, in the village of Sauvebon. Sauvebon is spelled S-A-U-V-E-B-O-N-N-E, Sauvebon. This is a parish in the city of La Navarre. And among those present hearing Don Bosco, there was also that young lady, eh, that young woman, who had been completely and miraculously healed by St. John Bosco after being blessed with the blessing of Mary, help of Christians. You who are listening and me, one day in heaven together shall be, always by the power of God's grace.